Well, we're so glad y'all decided to join us today. Here we are, a, a little bit of a cold. So I was on the road, Alexandra. I was on the road with Switch for Good uh, in Vancouver at the Planted Expo. We missed you very much. Yeah, I hear it's a huge expo. You said like 10,000 people. It was gigantic. It's it's like their 11th or 12th year. And I don't know what rock I've been living under because I only knew about them a couple of years ago. So they've been going. They have one in Toronto and uh, they have one in Vancouver. And and we were we were in Vancouver and we took the we took the show on the road, not this podcast show, but the switch for good booth and, uh, you know, Jason uh, Robel and I spoke at the event and it was really inspiring the whole the whole thing. I mean it's always fun to go to anything that's plant based, right? That's 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 gigantic like that in an expo center because you just know when you walk in you're not going to have to defend yourself. <laughs> you know, it's just that warm fuzzy feeling where it's like these are my people and no one's going to be like why are you eating that? You know, it's like yes. So it just it just felt good. It was just great vibes, incredible just energy and people, but I have to tell you that just a huge shout out to our Canadian Switch for Good podcast listeners because almost every other person that came by the booth said, "Oh my gosh, you're the podcast people." So I was like, oh, how cool. Yes, we are. We're the podcast people. Where's Alexandra? Well, she's not here right now, but she, she's, uh, she's with us in spirit. And it just, it just felt so good to talk to some of the listeners and hear their stories and hear the impact that our guests have made in their lives. Because, you know, we get the download numbers, right? We, we know that people are, are listening or they're downloading. No, I think they're listening to the downloads. So, but and and it's 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 really you know we've we've grown obviously an incredible amount over the over the years, but you don't really know the personal impact. And there were so many stories that I heard, but one that that really uplifted me. And and I know Will, you is this this one beautiful human. This lady said she has a very very uh, stressful job in healthcare, and so she comes home every day feeling just just you know just exhausted and drained and overwhelmed. And but she she you know has to walk her dog, wants to walk her dog at the end of every day. And she said, she walks out the door, she changes her shoes like Mr. Rogers and gra and grabs her dog and they go for a walk. And she said, she presses play on the switch for good podcast uh, every day. So she must be listening in 20 or 30 minute intervals, right? We don't put out a show every day, but, uh, but every week. And she just said, it's just, uh, it's just been a life-changing experience. And she comes back from the walk and is empowered and inspired. And, and, you know, a lot of the stress has melted away. And I mean, the, there's just almost nothing better than that, than hearing that. That's so great. I, I love Canada and I love Canadians. I used to be a Canadian resident, actually, and I worked as an actress so much in Canada. I didn't know that you're a Canadian resident. We were. Yeah, I was. Oh. I was. Yeah. I lost it because as soon as I got my residency, I stopped getting hired, I don't know, for films in Canada. And you have to be there three years out of five to be able to maintain oh. it. Um, but I loved, I was very proud of uh my Canadian residency and Ian and I at one point thought about moving there actually, because it's such a wonderful country. Uh, so, you know, really I is. would love to hear more since I wasn't at this expo <laughs> planted that uh, from our Canadian fans. So <clears throat> as Dotsy, as you know, and our listeners know, we've just started this new option that people can call in and record a question to us. So Canadian listeners out there, I'm talking to you, uh, go to switchforgood.org slash podcast and scroll down. You got to give it a hot minute because it needs to populate the page. But if you scroll down about, I think it's a third of the way, you'll see an orange, send a voice message to switch for good. And then there's a yellow button that says start recording. And we would love to get any questions you have about mm -hmm. our own routines, our own, whatever, personal lives, professional lives, um, health questions you have that we can either answer ourselves or ask our guests. And so please send a voice message to us so Dotsy and I can answer it on the air. We would love to hear it, especially from you Canucks. Yeah, right. It's a, and we're we'll, we're going to we're going to play it on the show. So um keep it under about 90 seconds. 
Cause I'm, yeah. one, I'm the one that tends to be, ramble on. So I get to say that like, <laughs> yeah. and, and it'll, it'll be, it'll be so enjoyable to have those conversations and, and, uh, and, and play it on the air. So yes, you might get selected. So go, go record. It is super easy. Like Alexandra said, switchforgood.org. And even if you can't remember a uh, forward slash podcast, you could just go to switchforgood.org and the drop down the podcast is right there. So uh, it, it really couldn't be any easier. We wanted it to be super simple. So you literally just like press the orange button and record just uh, just while you're sitting there on your laptop or your phone. So easy peasy. Yeah. And folks, we have a great guest coming up and especially to yeah. our friend in healthcare who's walking her dog right now. We say hello and we give your dog a big sloppy kiss. Yeah. Thanks for listening, y'all. Enjoy the guest. Our guest today is author and doctor Manisha Benoit, also known as the well-being doctor or Dr. B. Dr. Benoit is a specialist in integrative lifestyle medicine, culinary medicine, and nutritonomic biohacking. She's one of the few quintuple board certified physicians in the United States, and she's diagnosed over 1 million cancer cases. Dr. Benoit takes a personalized whole body approach to help her patients transform their health, and she leads wellness workshops and retreats throughout the world. We're thrilled to have Dr. Benoit with us today to hear her insights into biohacking the human body for lifelong well-being and learn more about her new book, The Anatomy of Well-Being. So welcome to Switch for Good, Dr. Manisha Benoit. Thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to talking to both you, Alexandra and Dotsie, and your community. <laughs> so tell me first, in the intro, we called you a nutrogenomic biohacker. Did I get that right? Can you tell us what that is? So nutrigenomics, it's, it's a relatively new study where we're looking at the food you eat, how it influences your genes. And we are now getting quite a bit of research around our gut microbiome and what we eat and how that affects our genes and how it affects um, how we make certain vitamins, minerals, neurotransmitters, and how it ultimately affects your whole body. I was especially intrigued before we um, jump into that topic in the in the intro, diagnosing over 1 million cancer ca cases. Three of my board certifications fall into um, anatomic, clinical, and cytopathology, okay. which uh, pathology is the uh, diagnosis of disease, whether it's from... Um, blood, uh, fluids, or tissues, like say you go into your doctor's office and you have a biopsy. Well, that I have been doing for over 15 years, and I've done it at a very busy cancer centers and busy uh, hospitals where we are seeing so much cancer day in, day out, and it, it's every part of the body. Um, and then on top of that, I have three fellowships in cytopathology, which is looking at single cells, um, taking much smaller tissue samples, whether that's from the breast or the thyroid or a lymph node, um, and also um, breast cancer, which I, I've done um, an entire year on just breast cancer. So all we're doing is looking at that. And then also bone and soft tissue cancer. So just because of all the training that I've had, I've been exposed to just being in that environment where under the microscope, I'm looking at what I call angry cells. And that's what we are creating in our body when we don't learn how to take care of our body is we create angry cells. And the worst, or I should say the angriest of them are tumor cells. Um, we have um, what we call our normal tissue and our normal cells in our body. And over time with exposure to environmental and lifestyle factors, those cells can transform if they're not taken care of. How do you keep a positive attitude? Uh, that is so much bad news that then the, the, the doctor, I'm assuming, of that patient has to go deliver to them. I mean, over a, a million times. How, how, how do you, I don't know. I just, I just, that, that just hit me like, gosh, that would be heavy all day, every day. Um, it is heavy all day, every day. And that is why I now have transitioned to the more preventative approach because I've spent mm -hmm. so much time in that space where you get the diagnosis and you're given options of surgery, chemo, radiation, which 
are often indicated, but then you're sent on your way thinking, oh, the cancer is not going to come back. But what I was seeing was people were getting new cancers or their cancer was coming back 10 years ago, uh, later when the missing link is we're not teaching people how to take care of themselves so they can prevent this, so they can prevent recurrence, they pre can prevent it from coming uh, something in the first place. And we've kind of failed as a society to help people how to take care of their bodies in this most basic way. Like I said, the way we sleep, the way we manage our stress, the way we move our body, what we put in our body. It's like I tell my patients, it's not rocket science, but we've been misguided to think that we get sick, we go to the doctors, the doctor will fix us. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about those, those pillars that you discuss sleeping, what we eat, how we move stress. Um, in your book, I know you deal with those. Uh, what can you tell us that might surprise us about any of those? Because, you know, Dotsie and I've been doing this show for over 230 episodes. So, and our listeners understand that whole foods are better and it's good to get sleep. <laughs> it's good not to be stressed, but can you, can you share with us something that we might not, um, that might not be so obvious to us in our care? Um, I don't know if this will surprise you, but so, some of the things that I often see with my patients um, when I start working with them is we really backtrack almost to their childhood, you know, and really we're taking a look at not just what's happening to you at this current moment with your current diagnosis, but we're backtracking to see what is your story um, what kind of mindset do you have around your healing process? Are you somebody who thinks that you can conquer it all? Or have you been told that, you know, you are the way you are and you're stuck with it and you actually believe that, right? Because our mindset is super powerful and we actually have the ability to change our mindset. And, and I think that is the most transformative or powerful key that no matter what diet you believe in or what fitness routine you believe in. Everybody can agree that having that mindset that you have the ability to change, if you put some work into it, that that will put you on a better path. Mm -hmm. So I think that's an important key for people to understand. And I mean, when I say change, change down to the cellular level where your brain connections, your neural connections change the chemicals that are released from your brain change and the physical structure of the parts of your brain change. Immediately yeah. made me think of, uh, of, of a friend of mine that is very um, go, going through a lot in his, in his very, uh, very much desires to uh, change her mindset and change her way of thinking and be more positive and less self-focused and joyful. We had a conversation and she said to me, I, I can't, I don't, I don't have the money for the big time therapist or even the medium time therapist, whatever you want to call. Uh, and I, I don't, I don't have deep pockets. I'm not really sure how I go about doing this. I want to be committed to it, but most people that's, I mean, including myself, that that's a, that, that's, that's a big prescription, right? I'm going to completely change the way I'm thinking, totally, you know, revamp, reform the way that my brain is processing thoughts and move them from the negative to the positive. And that is that, I mean, that that's going to be a journey, right? It's not going to be something overnight. What would you say to someone that says, I, I don't, I don't, I don't have the cash to have somebody walk me through this. Is there a book? Is there the first five steps? What would you, what would you say to them? Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's a great question because especially in our current times with inflation and stuff, we have to be uh, very protective of the money that we do have and use it wisely. Yeah. But here's the thing. When I, when I go back to those natural biohacking things and learning about them, I mean, if you have a cell phone, you can get on YouTube and literally learn everything um, or anything. Um Clearly, you can get my book, which is definitely a more cost effective way. But when it comes to transforming the mindset, one is accepting the fact that it is going to take time for change. So if you are a 40 year old individual and you're dealing with something that that mindset is 40 years in the making. 
right? So you can't expect it in one week of doing meditation or one week of doing breathing exercises or one week of going out for a walk in nature for it to be perfect. And there is no such thing as perfect also. So our health, whether that's our mindset health, whether that's our physical health, whether that's our emotional energetic is a lifelong journey. And every day we will come up against things that we need to have tools for to how to manage. And I go quite a bit into it about going from living a a mindless life to a more intentional life using the practice of uh, rituals. And so um, I talk about at least maybe not everybody thinks of habits as bad, but when I think of habits, it always gives me a negative connotation. And I talk about habits, routines, and rituals in my book. And tell us about the difference between them. And also, if you could give us, it sounded like breathing, walking in nature, and meditation were three ways to change mindset. Is that correct? And and if you could share one more, that would be great. Yes, absolutely. So another one um, to change your mindset is to surround yourself with other people whose mindset you want to be like. So if if you are in an environment with toxic people who are always gossiping or negative, those um, neural connections are going to get strengthened in your mind, okay? But if you're around your uh, other people who are like trying to have self-improvement, trying to make changes in your, in your life, you're going to learn from them. Um, so I think that's an important thing too is, is be cautious of, of who you're surrounding yourself with. And if you maybe at this time don't have somebody to surround yourself with, I know loneliness is, is our next generation of uh, problems that people are experiencing. There are so many groups out there now that are available online to connect with that can be, once again, a, a more cost affordable way of incorporating that. Um, and then your, your question before that is, what what do I kind of define as the difference between habits, routines, and rituals? Well, like I said, for me, I always think of habits as that negative um, thing that maybe you 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 have a cue that um, you walk into your office and somebody's bringing in donuts or somebody's bringing in bagels and you just see it and you're like, oh, let me just go take one. And it's a very um, unintentional um, act where it has very little self-awareness because it's just this cue that you see and you start doing it. Whereas uh, a routine is something that maybe you are putting your clothes out for the gym and you start going to the gym, but then you get tired of doing it because you didn't really have a intention behind it. So you get burnt out from that. Whereas rituals, place you in this greater degree of self-awareness and greater degree of intention. So it's a specific thing and it doesn't need to be a, like a ritual every day. Like it doesn't need to be a morning ritual. It can be once a year ritual that you go and do, but something that you're doing that has a clear intention behind it, that is going to improve your health and well-being. So that that's kind of my distinction. And you have greater self-awareness around that because you're like, I'm doing this for this specific purpose. And it's not just like I'm losing weight to so I, my bo- I want my body to look better. An example of that would be I'm losing weight so I can run around with my grandkids and keep up with that energy or I'm losing weight so I can go hiking on the next vacation my husband wants to go on. Right. So thinking a little bit beyond the the general approach. Right. So, so many people uh, will tell you that struggle with their uh, weight and being overweight, that they have uh, uncovered that they are stuffing past trauma. And they, 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 you know, that once they opened up that box to understand uh, how to change their neural pathways and process through that trauma that, that unlocked some of the, uh, ha- the reasons for the habits of, of stuffing it in literally mm-hmm. right through in their mouth. And, and that, and that feeling like they're stuffing it away. If there is someone that is uh, down and depressed and sad, but isn't 
able to or hasn't recognized an, uh, an inner trauma or an inner pain that maybe happened a, a ways away and they and they through the through some good mind work stumble upon it if you will is that is trauma also something that we can move through w- without a professional do you talk about in that in your in your book because yeah that that's that's that that's that's big stuff right and that's when scary stuff come up comes up and you don't necessarily have uh the skills yeah absolutely so we all have our own versions of trauma right and trauma is super personal to everybody whether it is an emotional childhood physical trauma whatever it is um it is it's a real thing and it is really important for people to work through it um and it, i talk quite a bit about it in my chapter on emotional exploration because you don't want that trauma to get almost in a way stuck in your body where it manifests as a disease. Because often with my cancer patients, especially my breast cancer patients, I'll ask them, was there anything that happened in the six to 18 months prior to your initial diagnosis? Was there a divorce in the family? Was there a parent's death? Was there, you know, something major? And 99% of the time, there has been something so major that they did not have the tools to regulate it. Now, when I talk about emotions, it's not about being happy all the time. Nobody is happy all the time, right? It's about recognizing, all right, I have this emotion. I might be sad. I might be angry, but I'm not going to hold on to it because I know what it will, or I understand that holding on to it will prevent me from getting to whatever better result that I want to have. So maybe you will start journaling about it. Journaling is a great way to process your emotions, get them out of your head, right? Um, and then I have some people who are like, well, I, I can't journal. I, I can't think of what to write. I'm like, okay, that's fine. Well, pick up your phone and record as if you're having a conversation to a girlfriend and nobody has to listen to it. But get your thoughts out so you have a way of of understanding what's going on instead of holding them in. That's And, And well, also helping fix your gut microbiome so you can create more of the happy neurotransmitters helps too. (laughs) Great transition into that. (laughs) There's a little more to it. Um, well, let's talk about that. Uh, I, I think what you what you've been talking about a lot is how everything is connected. But I, I want to just yeah. before we go to that, I have a question about what you brought up. You said you asked what happened like sixteen to eighteen months before. Now we've learned that cancer cells are in our body all the time, but they don't flourish. And is it that six to eighteen months before trauma? Is that why you ask it? Because cancer has been in the body for a decade, maybe, but is it the trauma that made it flourish? So um, I don't want to say there's scientific proof to this because this is something that's very hard to study in in individuals. So this is just objectively, I'm always talking to people about what else is going on in their life, right? And it's not that um, we are actually making cancer cells every day, each and every one of us. Okay, but why is it that some of us have a process in our body that causes apoptosis or the killing of those cells, whereas other people cannot and those cells flourish and turn into masses, which then those masses need to be removed or then they become metastatic. Uh, Why do some people do that? Right. And it is a multifactorial complex process. It is not one thing. It's not one food you eat. It's not one um, exercise you do. It's not one thought that you have. It's your whole kind of being of how you you are living, right? Um, From anywhere from the beauty products you're putting on your body to, you know, the pesticides and chemicals you're consuming. Um, Super multifactorial, but but what I have seen with with my, my cancer patients is that um, their mindset plays a key role, um, their support system plays a key role, and um, processing their previous trauma when there is one plays a key role. Hey, friends and listeners of the Switch for Good podcast. Yep, that's you. 
have some really exciting news. Dotsie and I have started a Switch for Good podcast Facebook group. We created it so we can build a community of fans that will help us improve the show and deliver on the topics that you want to learn more about. So we want to hear what your favorite content is, what you want more of, and what you want less of. And if you like the length of the show, Dotsie and I are always talking about the length of the show, right Dotsie? Yes. We want to tailor our show around the needs and desires of our incredible listeners, almost half a million of you. And it's really simple to join. Just go to our Switch for Good Facebook page, that's Switch, the number four, and then Good, and then click on Groups. And there we are, the Switch for Good podcast chat. You can post directly in the group, share ideas, talk to other listeners, and connect with like-minded folks. So go, run, join our Facebook group and tell us what you want. Dati mentioned the, the, the brain gut connection. Let's, let's talk about that. You say it's a two way street. Can you explain what that means? Yeah. So uh, I, I'm sure you and your community have heard this before, right? So a healthy gut equals a healthy mind, right? So we, we do have technically a two way street between the gut brain connection via the vagus nerve, which is the longest nerve in our body. Right. But We also know that because we have that connection and a significant amount of serotonin is made in your gut, when we have, and serotonin is your feel-good neurotransmitter, the one that medications like SSRIs are used to keep circulating, but you can't keep something circulating when you're not producing enough of it in the first place. (laughs) So that's where it comes to how can we make our gut microbiome um, healthy. And I, I do definitely in-depth testing in um, individuals to see the state of their gut microbiome. Um, and most of us are depleted both of the nutrients we need for our basic cells to function and the health of our gut microbiome has been damaged. And, and there was a really unfortunate event that happened here in my local town this, this past weekend where um, uh, an 18 year old went into a um, restaurant and basically stabbed his ex-girlfriend. And now she's in critical condition. And this is not somebody who, um, you know, uh, this is not somebody who you would expect this to happen to, but I'm pretty sure that his anxiety and stress and whether he was in a state of depression Um, was impacted by the fact that his gut microbiome was not very healthy. I mean, they were in Mr. Chubby's, which is a chicken wings kind of restaurant, right? So if you're eating that stuff, you're creating inflammation in your body, you're creating inflammation in your brain, your brain can't function properly. And if you're doing this continuously for years and years, our, like I said, you, you can transform your brain and the structures of your brain, whether that be your prefrontal cortex of reasoning or your amygdala of your flight and fright, you you can transform that with the different things you do. So whether that's mindfulness work or the food you eat, it can all impact it. So that's why I'm saying multifactorial things. We can't blame one thing, but we do have to look at what is going on and what what we are kind of exposing both Mm -hmm. our children to, our next generation to, and ourselves to. I mean, my, my youngest patient of um, breast cancer was 18 years old. Her genetics are fine. She didn't have genetics mutations. It's our lifestyle. And her lifestyle was that since the age of like nine or 10, she was in the hair salon. She was getting her nails done. She was using the beauty products at, you know, the, the local stores and stuff. And she, she had a buildup of toxins that her body could not process anymore. And how do you deal with someone who does have uh, these toxins in their body? I know um, there are different kinds of toxins that you talk about, um, actual pesticides or endocrine disruptors. Can you go into those a little bit and what you can do to help somebody? Uh, I've had a couple of friends who had mercury poisoning and they had to detox but otherwise I don't really know. I mean, it's otherwise it's so hard to know, like my mom has Parkinson's and one of the things people say is that it might've been exposure to um, 
uh, pesticides. She was a gardener. And so who knows, but, but we know that it all adds to our toxic burden. Yeah. So, um, we're all getting exposed to pesticides every day. I mean, I, I live in a community where the lawns are sprayed with incredible pesticides, right? But once again, why are some be people able to combat them and others, it, it really affects them. That's that's kind of the key message here, right? And it's a matter of, I believe, our gut microbiome plays a significant role and the gut barrier function and how strong that little army of enterocytes or gut lining cells is plays a key role in whether those pesticides, toxins, metabolites, medications, the things flow through us and don't enter our bloodstream and go to our uh, brain and contribute to Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, autism, ADHD, to our skin and contribute to psoriasis and acne or to you know our met metabolism and contribute to mitochondrial dysfunction or obesity or, you know, cancer being the worst of it. I, I mean, at this point, I don't, I'm not sure if cancer is the worst of it because we have so many diseases we're dealing with, but I truly believe that it all stems from the strength of our gut. And, and that actually has been known for over 5,000 years in Ayurveda, which is a 5,000 year old whole body system, right? They always say, let's focus on the gut. And then we, when, if you heal the gut, other parts of your body can heal. So, <clears throat> You mentioned in the gut inflammation, right? That can be caused by eating at Mr. Chubby's, which none of us would probably argue. Um, but also you want to feed those 3 million little buggies down there, the right food so that the good ones that can make and create and circulate the serotonin. And I'd like some oxytocin too with my serotonin. Uh, we've, we, I feel like we have heard this many times, but I guess I'm more interested in why is it that cruciferous vegetables and fruits and nuts and lots of legumes and fiber, why, what is it about those that feed the, the good bugs mm -hmm. and starve the bad bugs? Yes, absolutely. So um, when you think of the different things going on in your gut microbiome, you got to think of the three P's, right? So you got prebiotics, you have probiotics, and then you have what we call postbiotics. Okay. And in um, the prebiotics, that is our basically probiotics everybody's familiar with. Those are our live culture, our bacteria, our actual microbiota, right? Prebiotics are a food for the good gut bacteria. So you've got to put in that food for them. And some um, forms of prebiotics are going to be things like asparagus, apples, um, bananas, onions, leeks, um, dark leafy greens, right? So you want to feed them that stuff, all right? And then the good stuff will proliferate. Now, when the good stuff is proliferating in, and, and you don't want it to over proliferate because you can have microbiome overgrowth. So you can have both microbiome deficiency, meaning you don't have enough of the good stuff, or you can have microbiome overgrowth, which also... Yeah. So you have both sides. Too much good stuff? You can have too much good stuff. Yeah. So this is why we don't just say, oh, go take all the pro probiotics off your shelf. You know, no. Right. Right. Um, so we want to feed the, the good gut bacteria, but then we do that because those probiotics or good gut bacteria create something called postbiotics. And postbiotics are the metabolites after that. So that's your things like short chain fatty acids and things that your body needs to function and, and fight off disease. And it's, and it's very interesting to see now, because now that they're, now that they're starting to do more research, we can identify certain um, bacterial strains that are linked to certain diseases. For example, one that I often um, check um, in my patients is acromensia. And um, seeing low amounts of acromensia has been linked to um, obesity, which another problem we're experiencing. It has been linked to inflammatory bowel disease. It's been linked to type 2 diabetes. And it has been linked to both a cancer and how you will respond to cancer treatment. 
right? So um, your microbiome, depending on the health of it, can impact how you're even going to respond to medications and treatment, right? And then, uh, so how would you, first of all, you want to check if you have low acromancy. If, uh, if you have some of those conditions that I mentioned, more than likely you do, how can you increase it? Well, you don't just go take a supplement. Yes, you, that might be indicated, but what you really want to do is starting with foods that are rich in polyphenols that can help increase it, right? So polyphenols are found in dark leafy greens, those same things that I was talking about, green tea, um, brightly colored fruits and vegetables, berries, grapes, you know, all, so it's really looking at, I like to say it's like almost like a chemistry thing where our body is these chemical reactions happening. And at some point when we don't give the body what it needs and a majority of what it needs is plants, when we, when we don't give that high percentage of plants, and I'm not talking about the one salad a week people are eating and going, yes, I had a salad. I'm talking about 75% of every plate having plants on it. When we don't give the body that much, at some point, our body cells get angry and start creating either symptoms or um, mutations. And so, the, so when people think of genetics, there's the genetics that you're born with. And then there's the mutations you develop over your lifetime because your body is getting exposed to things. Okay. So when a patient comes in to you and they're not feeling good, what do you look at? Do you, do you take a gut uh, sample, a uh, stool sample, I guess? For, uh, uh, to, to, is that your first line of figuring things out? And what do you generally, because there's so much a patient can do, right? You know. Yeah. Don't garden with, don't use these pesticides. Don't buy plastic, blah, blah, blah. Where, where do you start with them? So where, where do you start with the diagnosis and how do you get them to change? <laughs> yeah, so um, the, they usually come to me with a diagnosis because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm an expert um, consultative physician, meaning they've already got their diagnosis and their doctor is telling them this and they're not sure they want to go on that medication or they just want to see what other options are out there. Um, and so what I start with, and, and you know, I, I pretty much say I'm, I'm working on restoring your health at a cellular level. I mean, I literally pull out my, my cell and show them what's going on in the cell so they realize, right? And then I do very in-depth testing where I'm looking at how their body is functioning in those ninth grade chemistry reactions that we all don't want to remember, but are important, right? Like all our different cycles, glycogen cycles, urea cycles, all that. I'm looking at that from a antioxidant perspective, vitamins, minerals, um, um, inflammatory omegas, heavy metal toxins. Like you mentioned, somebody with mercury, um, I'm looking at, um, the metabolites that they are producing through these chemical reactions, like what are they making too much of? And then kind of you backtrack to, all right, this cycle is being affected. So that's my starting point. And um, a lot of this, of, of what I do is we go deep into their nutrition. So I meet people where they're at um, because it is not easy to go plant-based and not, and it's also, once again, not an overnight journey. Um, th this is even for me, it was a journey from going from eating everything and going, oh my God, why are these people getting cancer? Because I'm diagnosing it and it wasn't making sense to me at the same time. I'm diagnosing it. We're giving them the, the treatment. They're not getting better. I need to look deeper because I don't want to end up with cancer. So, you know, th this is kind of how all this came about. And, um, then really looking at their nutrition down to the number of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, um, fats, quality fats, you know, um, different things that they're eating, supporting it with supplementation while they are on their journey to incorporate new foods. And I do do what I call functional culinary medicine is I'm walking through people how to actually prepare these foods. So um, it's very important. I, I was actually quite surprised how a lot of people don't know how to prepare anything. You know, like I had one patient with breast cancer years ago and it took her three hours to make a salad. And I'm like, what are you doing? And she's like, 
Well, I laid out all the, the dark leafy greens. I was drying them and I'm like, oh my goodness. Like sometimes, I, you know, because I, I grew up cooking and I, uh, I grew up watching my mom cook home cooked meals. And um, I'm like, okay, we have a spectrum of people who know things in the kitchen and who don't. So it's like, you got to help everybody because it, everybody can be healthy and happy. Then we can have a better world to live in. Um, so, and then once we start on that path and we kind of start getting them in this place where they're feeling more energetic because the food gives them energy, that's when we go in and check what's going on in their gut. Uh -huh. So, and almost everyone, actually everyone <laughs> has a gut problem. And it's funny because they don't believe that the test could ever be normal. And so what I do is I show them mine because I do mine every year and I'm like, look, these scores are possible, but I also do all of this, right? Because I can't show them other patients' results. So I show them mine as a comparison that, you know, th this was years in the making. So, and you're saying what you do to get this uh, good gut score is eat at least 75% plants, 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 and uh -huh. Support. Yeah, I, I'm plant based. Um, I, I am 100% plant based. Um, I'm also now gluten free. So I, I've gone from eating everything to pescatarian to vegetarian to vegan to now gluten free. So and um, tell yeah. us about that, because we've heard that, you know, gluten is bad for people with celiac, but not everybody agrees that it's um, important for everyone to go gluten-free. And so if you could touch on three issues, gluten, soy, and advanced glycation end products. Yes. Oh, those are great ones. Okay. So let me work my way backwards. Um, advanced glycation end products. So this is a end product that is naturally found in animal proteins. Um, you can increase that product it, with barbecuing. So when you barbecue meats, you make more advanced glycation end, end products, which abbreviated is ages. So it literally is aging your cells, right? Uh, two of the, the key foods that have that are some of our favorites, bacon and Parmesan cheese have very, very high amounts of that but all animal products do. So I usually tell my patients, well, if it's barbecue season, which is around the corner, put some veggies on the grill because that won't make them. And um, so when I'm thinking of aging our cells, it's our, our cells, they can only stay healthy for so long. So we don't wanna give them things that are gonna make them prematurely age or transform, um, mutate into precancerous, cancerous cells whatever they might turn into, or just become dysfunctional. And now um, you're not producing the hormones you should have been producing because the cells aren't working in this organ and they're not making them. So, um, and then soy is- so real quick, um, I, yeah. I, I think I lost, it was, so put the veggies on the grill or don't put the veggies yes, on Yes, you can put the veggies on the grill because oh, they do okay. not contain the protein naturally okay. that um, becomes- increases during grilling. I mean, you're going to get it in animal products anyway, but once you put them on a grill, they're even worse than if they were just like slowly right. heated. <laughs> right. But it's not a, the same for like a zucchini. As, yes. Uh, or, no, right. it's not the it. same. Okay. It, and charring makes it even worse. Is that correct? Yes. Or, yes. Yeah. Charring so, makes it worse. Yeah. That's so, what I'm saying. The barbecue, we usually go for that charred, uh, charred yeah. effect on the barbecue. Yes. Okay. Um, and then soy Soy is actually good for you. I have all my patients on soy as long as um, they do not have a soy allergy. Um, once again, I'm, I, I know cooking tofu is a challenge for people. So I, I don't know why that one, that one is a little tricky. So we start with things like edamame or organic non-GMO soy milk. But um, if you can get to tofu, I love making... Um, uh, tofu scramble, or I'll actually make tofu croutons. So you, you make them in the size of croutons, you flavor them like croutons, you put them on your salad, they have that crunchy, you know, effect. Mm -hmm. And now you're able to get some soy in and, and prep it in advance. Um, but soy has been found to be quite protective for both men and women from a cancer perspective for both breast cancer and prostate cancer. 
And it also can help reduce um, cholesterol and LDL levels. Mm -hmm. Um, so that is also an important reason because we have a lot of people that have elevated cholesterol and, and they've never eaten soy before in their life. You know, they don't even know what it is. Um, so I tell people, if you want to try it, tr try it somewhere outside. So you can kind of get a night, like at a nicer restaurant where you can kind of get the feel of what it is and mm -hmm. then start incorporating it into your diet. I have a real quick question, uh, but before we hop, hop to the next, um, food, gluten, as far as allergies and intolerances go, we've, I ate a ton of soy too, definitely learned on this podcast uh, how protective it is. Uh, but I'm wondering if most, maybe not allergies, but some, but a lot of intolerances are because of overuse. And there could be easily be somebody, right, that's just transferring or moving over to a plant-based side that's like, oh, I've never had soy. But we have just in the United States, uh, 560,000 soy farmers, to which 98 0.8% of that is fed to farm animals. So people have had a ton of soy in their diet if they've eaten animals, if, if that's, so is that, is that most of the reason is overused for intolerances or am I off base there? Um, well, what I have found is the tolerances and sensitivities to foods um, will change over an individual's lifetime. Okay. And it will change based on the health of their gut lining or the, their enterocytes. So their, their microbiome, their microbiome, their actual lining. Um, you, like, for example, um, I used to have banana milkshakes all the time. Like it was one of those quick things like, you know, come home yeah. from school, have a banana milkshake. No problem. I cannot tolerate it anymore. And it may be because one, I overdid the amount of bananas I had. Okay. Two, um, maybe there was a point where my gut got exposed to a antigen on the bananas that I'm, I'm buying, um, you know, and I, I just became sensitive to it. But once your gut is healed, because I did have a time where my gut was not healed. And um, once your gut is healed, then you can tolerate it again. And that's the same thing when it comes into gluten per se, right? So there are certain things in our foods that um, our body does not recognize, therefore we don't mm. tolerate it that well. So for example, yesterday, one of my patients goes to me, she goes, oh, I finally went gluten-free and it was a game changer. And I'm like, yeah, I know when I went gluten-free, it was a game changer for me too, especially in uh, post-menopausal, perimenopausal women, all of a sudden oh. they're like feeling like, oh, the bloat, the gut, you know, it's starting to work. But if you're going to Italy, eat the pizza. If you're going to Paris, have the baguette because the food there is very different than the food in our country. In fact, so much so that I remember when I was in Norway, I went to an asparagus farm and um, got fresh asparagus. And one of the things with asparagus is when you eat it, it does change the smell of your urine. I don't know if you've ever noticed, yeah. um, but it does. But when I ate it there, it was like, nothing. So I'm like, what are they doing? Or or what is so concentrated in our asparagus hair that is causing that? So my, my feeling is, and my observation has been that here, even though we have access to so much, um, we are a overfed, undernourished population with our body is just not functioning the way it should. Uh, and also just to note that, um, with soy, you are not a fan of soy protein isolate, I think. Is that right? So there, just cause it says soy, it's not all good. Can you, can you explain the differences? Yes. So, uh, soy protein isolate is a, um, kind of chemically byproduct produced thing, right? So it's the same thing, like you're putting in protein shakes or in protein bars or in, um, soy chicken nuggets or soy hot dogs in excess, our body does not know what to do with it. So it's not a real food. You know, I, I, the best place and the easiest place for people to start is just start eating real food, right? Before you go, oh, I'm going to become plant-based or I'm going to, you know, do dairy-free or gluten-free. Let's just first try eating real food and see how we feel. Because once you kind of start feeling what and tasting what real food 
taste like. Like my my taste buds are so sensitive now that if I eat a salad that is not organic, I taste the pesticides right away. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. So, uh, but like I said, everybody's on their journey. So we got to start where we're at and slowly making those shifts. And then you can take off when you're like, oh, okay, I know how to do this now. Yeah. So make it harder than it is. We, we tend to make health too hard and it's not that, you know. This is just whole foods. It's interesting that you asked that, Alexandra, because I was just uh, discussing, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, uh, and, and it comes up all the time, quite frankly, the, the, the study that the dairy industry paid for has been, it's been over 20 years, it's like 21 years ago, um, where they did the study on rats with soy and the rats, they gave them more soy than any human being would ever even be able to assimilate in a lifetime. Like it was an astronomical, unreasonable, insane amount of soy. Like if you had that much kale, you'd probably grow tumors, but the rats grew tumors. But the other thing that they, um, oh, this is to you know, show that, uh, dairy is better than soy milk. Is that what well, no, no, no. It was just to, to, to make people think that, uh, soy gives you man boobs. That's where we got that, that mm-hmm. idea that still lives on today. Um, and, as you know, because I've said it on the show, my, my favorite quote from Dr. Neil Bernard is, I challenge you to walk down any beach anywhere in the world and see a guy with man boobs and walk up to him and ask him what he eats. And I 100% guarantee you he will not say tofu. So it is probably not the story that's giving them the man boobs. But um, that uh, study was done only with soy isolate as well. Yeah. Oh. Not, and not any it whole came- soy. When it came out in, in, what was it, the New York Times so long ago, it confused people beyond, um, right? like like it still goes on. That's like I'm do. constantly explaining it to people, especially when constantly. I start asking them to start incorporating it. And they're like, well, mm-hmm. I can't have this, you know? And, and like I said, I deal with breast cancer patients and they're like, no, we've been told. And I'm like, actually, <laughs> it's good for that, you know? So yeah. Um, yeah, there, there is a lot of misguidance and misinformation. And, and, and I think we have to look at the sources. We also have to look at how things are being interpreted. Technically, you can have research that claims both sides of everything. But the reality mm-hmm. is, yeah. like, for the people who are working with individuals and what they're seeing, like, yeah. I mean, what I was seeing under the microscope, these angry cells was enough for me to give up all these things. Trust me, my last meal before I went vegan was the biggest mac and cheese that I could find, you know? So <laughs> trust me, like, so it's, it's not that this is an easy thing. It's just, I, I've seen so much and I don't, I don't want my own health journey to go down that way. And I don't think if people actually understood or knew, and I, and I don't expect them to do, you know, 20 years of training, like I've done to understand this, but Mm-hmm. We have to start somewhere. And what we are doing is, is not working anymore. It's just not working anymore. No. Yeah. And I think it's so important to understand the role of marketing too, because I, I feel like I've been unraveling uh, and fighting against this one study from so long ago, but they spent so much money marketing it and twisting the the, the, not only the facts of it, but what the study was actually done on and how much they got and that it was all isolate, all the things we've talked about that. It, I mean, it, you, you just think of the, if the, you know, somebody that's maybe pro plants like you, you put out a study, you know, no, nobody, nobody's the, the whole world isn't going to be talking about it because it is such a machine via our government through milk pep to your front door. And they have, they've probably spent I would say over over a hundred million dollars um, marketing that study over the last twenty years, and so well, as you know, it's gotten healthcare is a business. Practice, healthcare is a business. The business yeah. is to keep our hospitals and pharmaceutical companies and mm-hmm. you know insurance companies continuing to run. Um, mm-hmm. Anybody who says it's not a business it has I don't know they haven't mm-hmm. opened their eyes. It's it's a hundred percent a business. But, but I will share that the, one of the, I, I wouldn't, all these studies are interesting to me, but um, one that just came out this past month, because um, I used to uh, work in a uh, GI doctor's office in um, New York and um, all day, every day, colonoscopies, colonoscopies, taking out biopsies, 
biopsy after biopsy after biopsy and basically removing um, what we call polyps. And we have ones that are considered precancerous polyps like tubular adenomas or SSP sessile serrated polyps. And, and I'm just looking at these day in, day out. And the patients are basically coming in like, like a machine, like getting their colonoscopy, getting the polyp removed, being sent home, and nothing has changed in their lifestyle, right? And we know that, so the interesting thing is there, there was a study that just came out that showed that the tubular adenomas and the SSP polyps, which are both precancerous polyps, are linked with a certain gut microbiome and Ooh. certain uh, cer certain bacteria, right? So if we can influence that through our diet, which our diet is what makes our microbiome, imagine how we can stop cancer early on, right? Because those are the precancerous things. Um, so that that study, I think, just came out of Mass General um, last month. And, that, and, it, and it's good because it's like seeing that the metabolites that are produced, um, that the environment that the body is living in, whether the body has a high amount of these enzymes produced by these bad gut bacteria or these bile acids produced by this gut bacteria can influence these little things to grow in our colon. Yeah. So I wanted to yeah. actually, can we go back to um, the gut? because there was a question I had when we were talking about the probiotics, it sounds like it's so important. So I just wanted our listeners, should they be going out and buying probiotics? And if so, which ones? And if you mm. could explain a little bit, it's, is it about the crowding out or are there some probiotics that will get those bad probiotics that give you polyps and eat them up? So how does it, how does it, kind of work that way? So what I recommend first is start with probiotic rich food. Okay. Always. Everybody should be eating probiotic rich food that has the live bacteria, live cultures in them. In fact, you should be eating it with all three of your meals. If you're eating three meals, make sure you have probiotic rich foods with breakfast, so that's, lunch, and dinner. So is that fiber or is that sauerkraut fermented food? So that would be things like non-dairy yogurt, non-dairy kefir that would be things like um kimchi and sauerkraut that would be things like pickled your own pickled vegetables okay low sugar like pickled kombucha. cabbage and stuff yep cabbage. like that okay. well the the fermented cabbage is sauerkraut right so um and then and and if you actually look at other cultures and what they're eating with their meals, almost every culture, except the American culture, has some form of fermented foods with their meals, meaning um, in uh, my native culture, which is an Indian culture, we always have a yogurt, you know, so uh, with our meals. Um, miso soup mm. is a popular um, pro uh, probiotic rich food that is seen in um, Asian cultures. Um, you will see like in the Mediterranean, they will have um, uh, pickled um, vegetables, like root vegetables. And um, so if you actually start looking, it, it already exists in our food. We just don't eat it every day and we don't incorporate. I mean, OK, maybe we have with our salami sandwich, we might have a pickle on the side, but that's as far as I see like the consistency with our meals, you know, um, that we're having it regularly. So yeah. I would say start with probiotic rich food before you go for the bottle, because that I would want the individual to test for to see what they needed, because there are so many probiotics on the market that it can become challenging to decide which one is the right one for you. And you really want to work with somebody who understands supplementation. So you don't get too much overgrowth because like I said, overgrowth of a microbiome is just as bad as a deficiency in a microbiome. Now I heard that pickling and fermenting were different and that, that it's the ferment fermented foods that are good for the microbiome, but not so much the pickling. Is that is that true? Well, fermented foods will definitely have more live cultures in them, but you can do a quick pickle and still get some, some nutrients in it. Okay. Yeah. I think one uses salt, one uses vinegar. I'm not even sure. What um, uh, so 
a quick pickle will use vinegar. Okay. And a fermentation will use um, sugar, actually. It's, it's because the bacteria mm. are eating the sugar and it's getting more fermented. So like when you think of kombucha, there's actually, it's, it's basically tea, water, and sugar. And then it starts this fermentation process. Yeah. Oh, and okay. what about vinegars by themselves? Do they, do they have some power in the probiotic category or not so much? So vinegars, like things like apple cider vinegar, you know, people do those apple cider vinegar. Yeah, I like it on my salads. Like I do yeah. all sorts of different types of vinegars because I love the flavor. So vinegars can really help with um, individuals who have mild digestion, meaning their body doesn't have the ability to break down their foods properly. Mm -hmm. So when we're looking at the gut microbiome, I'm looking at it from multiple perspectives, not just the imbalance between the good and bad gut bacteria. I'm looking at it from the... Um, malabsorption perspective, meaning you might be eating the best diet in the world, but your body doesn't have the ability to break it down. You want to know some of the people who don't have the best ability to break it down is all the people who have had their gallbladders removed and told mm. they can continue eating what they want to eat, but they can't because they don't have a place for those bile acids to be stored for that fatty food to be processed, you know? So it, it's, it's a little bit more complex. So we've got our maldigestion, we've got our inflammation. Inflammation can be caused by um, poor diet, um, high uh, refined carb diet, high protein diets, pesticides, food additives. Um, we also can cause it by medications. We can be caused, you know, so many things can, can kind of cause this. And then we also have our metabolic pathways can be affected. Um, so lots, lots going on, pretty complex, but that's why, you know, I do okay. what I do. <laughs> and, and people should get your book because it sounds yes. like there's a lot of great information. Just this time that we've spent together, I think there've been many things that you've said that no one else has said. So Wonderful. my question from the beginning, um, I really appreciate it. Uh, your you. attack. So this I know stuff that. I'm changing and that's hard to do. Cause like Alexander said, it's, we're almost 250 in. So, <laughs> so, so what's, what's your takeaway that you're going to change? Well, I, I, I don't eat something pickled or fermented with every meal. I didn't really know that that was, those are, pro, those are the pre-biotics. Probiotics. I mean, I, they're the pro. Yes. But we should eat them with every meal. You said with every meal. ideal yes. world. Yes. Um, I the love it. Are fiber, right? Fiber is the prebiotic. Pre the prebiotics food. are types of um, fiber, right, right, like right. cellulose, inulin, that kind of stuff. Yes. Right. I wasn't, so I love them. And now I just want to get them all and, and add them. Cause I, when, whenever it's in a meal and I, I love it. And it made me think too of my husband because he hates them. He hates everything pickled vinegary, any of that flavor. It made me think what, what, what could I do for him? Yeah. So, uh, if people listening, I'm sure there's people listening that are the same as he is. They're like, Oh, it's the worst flavor ever. Yes. So th there is ways that you can incorporate this, right? So, um, for example, for breakfast, um, look at what you're already having. If you are a smoothie kind of person, put in some kefir or non-dairy yogurt into your smoothie to make it creamy. If, um, or if you're eating oatmeal, put two spoonfuls. And I'm not talking about huge amounts, just small amounts. So you're consistently getting these live cultures, these nutrients in. Yeah. But that's the problem. He would taste it if I put a drop on there. I mean, he hates the flavor of all. Of yogurt as well? And vinegar. Yeah. That, yogurt, you don't like, really taste the vinegar taste though in yogurt. Well, the, the fermented, I guess is what, yeah. Anything yeah. with that. He, you know, he's always like, I can, can smell it even. He doesn't even have to taste it. I usually recommend people are quite used to having their wine glass in the evening. And I'm like, well, why don't we use the same wine glass, but put a little shot of kombucha in there, low sugar kombucha, you know? Right. Oh, okay. Um, because that's just a habit we like doing is like having something in the evening. Um, okay. There's probiotic chocolates that you can get. Now you're so, I mean, th there's ways when you start kind of looking. You know, okay. Um, lunch, like yesterday, what did I make for dinner? I made a um, 
uh kimchi nori wrap so you know with the big nori seaweeds and kimchi in it with cucumbers avocado carrots sprouts and greens wrapped it up and i mean like a five minute meal because is I nori it. considered a probiotic <laughs> is what nori no nor nor well nori right. is probably a seaweed is I'm not, I don't, I wouldn't put it in the probiotic category, but uh, maybe in the prebiotic, I might put he it. He loves that. He loves everything from the sea, like that, you know, he How about that. miso soup then? Start, yeah. start yep. giving, there you go. A okay. cup of miso soup is a great okay. place to start. And okay. he can have that for breakfast. I was actually just okay. on a, a vegan cruise earlier this year where they served miso soup for every breakfast. Yeah. 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 Right. So. Okay. Yeah. So that's a good start. We've got something yeah. for him. Yeah. Okay. We're good. <laughs> we can move on now. Thank you for the personal <laughs> targeted so, advice. <laughs> I'd like to finish just you, you, I mentioned in the intro that you uh, do health retreats and I've always wondered if health retreats are helpful because you go to a totally different place with all people who think the same way as you do. And you are exposed to completely different things and you're, you're not even given options to do anything really yeah. not healthy. And then you come home to your same life. Can you tell us why you feel a health retreat might be um, a good thing? If, and, and also the cost can be very expensive. So the, tell, tell us a little bit about why health retreats are worth the cost and why they might help even when you get home. Yeah. So when it comes to your health, I, I consider your health is really the biggest place you should be investing anyway, whether it's with the right doctor or, uh, you know, your retreat, the health retreat can be one of those rituals that you do once a year, you know, um, we spend a lot of money going on vacations where, you know, we, we go and we eat poorly, we feel worse when we come back and we go back to work, right? So what's the difference with a health retreat? Mm -hmm is that it, it's part of your own self-development and learning skills to improve yourself. So if you go in with that intention that there, there's there's something that I need to experience and the best part is you get to feel it. And once you kind of get that, it's kind of like that runner's high. When you get that feeling and you can recognize it, when you're on a retreat and you can get that feeling where your mind is so relaxed, you're, everyone told me on my last retreat that their bowels have never moved so good, <laughs> you know, so it was a restore your mind and gut retreat, right? Because I, I focus on the mind and gut. And, um, but once you get that feeling, even if you come back and do 1% of that, it's going to be better than where you started. Because mm. if you continue on your path, you're eventually going to come across a health condition that you you wish you would have present prevented. And, and that's what all my patients say to me is like, I wish I would have known this. Mm -hmm. I, I wish I would have known. And I'm like, well, I, I wish you did too. But that's unfortunately not not the way like people wait like to be reactive instead of proactive. So a health retreat mm -hmm. is a proactive way of taking care of your health. And, and, you know, like the hashtag that I use is for me, it's like cell care is self care, right? Cause I'm all focused on your cells and I don't want your cells to be angry. So take care. Everybody knows what self care is, but let's prioritize cell care. Okay. You've convinced me. Thank cell you. Care. <laughs> so, <laughs> let's go together. <laughs> yes, Dr. You guys can come to my next one. You're going to love it. <laughs> Amazing. So where can people find you and your book? The anatomy yes. of so um, my book, The Anatomy of Wellbeing, it's available um, on Amazon, Barnes and Noble online. Um, and I'm found on social media. And my website is basically my name, drbenote.com um, and Dr. Benote. So pretty, pretty easy to find. Yeah, and, and I also have a great cookbook that you can download from my website, which is all plant based and gluten free. And once again, free. So very and cool. I downloaded it and that cauliflower um thing I have written down it's a cauliflower steak it's, yes. and it looks easy Dotsie it doesn't have too many ingredients Dotsie. okay <laughs> not more than a few ingredients and it really looks good so I'm all gonna all of those recipes have been tested in live cooking classes here locally that 
are from non-plant-based eaters. Okay. Cool. So even if you're not plant-based, you are going to love these recipes. Yeah. That is good to know. Amazing. Good. We'll go get to both books then, everybody. <laughs> All right. We'll see you next time. All right. Thank you. <laughs> hey, folks. Okay. Back by very popular demand is our plant-powered plate fridge magnet, which you are going to receive for free if you leave us a rating and a review on whatever platform you're listening to this podcast on. So here are the details. Just write your quick review. Does not need to be long. Does not need to be a whole story. Just be honest and speak from the heart. Then take a quick screenshot of the review you wrote and email it to us at podcast at switchforgood.org. That's podcast at switchforgood.org. And include your mailing address so we can send you a power plate. We are doing this because the more reviews we garner, the higher we go in search results, which means more folks will learn about our podcast. So the power is in your hands. Leave us a review and zoom, zoom, your power plate arrives at your doorstep. So thank you so much for tuning in today. If we helped you in any way, then click the subscribe button and let's keep hanging out together. We have so much more to share with you. And if you need more information on actually making the switch for good, please visit us at switchforgood.org for loads of info. And you can subscribe to our mailing list where you will receive all sorts of super cool gifts, discount codes to our very fave dairy-free products, and a lifetime of powerful health tips. So join us on the journey to switch for good. This is the future.